A very good evening aspirants. I have an important announcement regarding prelims test series offered by Shankar IAS Academy. Yes, it is about pre storming batch 3. The orientation for this batch is already concluded and the first test will commence on 20th November 2022. That is coming Sunday. Till you have a chance to enroll in batch 3, those who have missed the chance to enroll already, the window to register is still open. Use it and enhance your prelim score. With this happy note, now let us move on to the Hindu news analysis for the date 17th of November 2022. Displayed here are the list of news articles that we are going to discuss today. You can go through it. Now without much delay, let us get into the article discussion. Have a look at this news article. Yesterday at the Tamil Nadu Raj Bhavan, the governor felicitated four tribal students who have cleared NEET and joined MBBS recently. See, they were felicitated at a function organized to commemorate the birth anniversary of tribal leader Birza Munda. And this is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, now let us see about the Munda Ulugulan or the Munda Rebellion. See, Munda Rebellion is one of the most prominent tribal revolts in the history of Indian independence. But to know about the Munda Rebellion, you should know who are these Mundas and also about Birsa Munda. First of all, who are Mundas? Mundas are the central Indian tribe. They are recognized as an immigrant tribe in Tripura. So where is their original homeland then? See, their original homeland was at Chota Nagpur. And these Mundas are proto-asteroid tribe. And what about their language? Mundari is their language, which is belongs to Austro-Asiatic family. So this is about Mundas. Now who is this Birza Munda? See, Birza Munda is a tribal freedom fighter belonging to the Munda tribe. And why is he so famous? See, Birsa aroused the tribal mindset and mobilized them in a little town of Chotangpur and revolted against the British. So, he was a terror for the British rulers. Now, let's know the cause of Munda rebellion and how it all started. Here, you have to know that the Mundas followed the Kunkati system. Now, what is this Kunkati system? See, Kunkati system of the Mundas was actually a joint ownership of land or holding a land by tribal lineage. The Mundas usually cleared the forests and made the land fit for cultivation. So the land belonged to the whole clan and not a particular individual. And this joint land holding system is what called Kunkati system. Now what the British did was, they replaced this egalitarian system with the Zamindari system. So the outsiders entered the tribal landscape and started exploiting them. And the Mundas were compelled to work as forced laborers on their own land. Then poverty engulfed them like a suffocating chain. This is because at this time the great famine of 1895 broke out. Then what Birsa Munda did was he led the tribals primarily to prevent non-tribals from taking land. Also he wanted to prevent the Mundas from working as bonded laborers. So he organized his first protest march for emission of forest dues. Apart from this, in 1894 Birsa announced his declaration against the Bhutis and the Dikus. The Dikkus were outsiders who exploited the tribal land. So this began the Munda Ulugulan. And this Munda Ulugulan is very important rebellion of the tribal people among the various uprisings of the tribals and peasants in India in the 19th century. And during this struggle, Birsa Munda managed to bring the tribal community under a single umbrella and asked them to re-establish their own kingdom. Birsa also advocated the tribal people to reject the missionaries and return to their traditional ways. Then he also asked tribal people not to pay taxes. And for these reasons, he was arrested in 1895 and released after two years. Then in 1899, he resumed his armed struggle along with the people. He raised police stations, government property, churches and house of Samindars. Finally, the British caught him in 1900 from Jamkopai forest, Chakradarpur. And Birsa Munda died on June 9th, 1900 while lodged at the Ranchi jail, aged just 25. Although the rebellion could not reach the decided end, it left a significant impact on the tribal movement of India. It showed that the tribal people had the capacity to protest against injustice and express their anger against colonial rule. And the British enacted the Chota Nagpur Tenancy Act 1908 and this act restricted the transfer of tribal land to non-tribal people. Thus, the Kunkati rights were recognized and as a consequence of this, the tribal won a degree of legal protection for their land rights. 
because of all these efforts of birsa munda presently he is being worshiped as bhagwan in the state of jharkhand that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about mundas then about birsa munda and finally about munda rebellion see these types of topics are frequently asked in upsc prelims examination so make note of each point that we discussed with these key points in mind now let's move on to the next news article discussion take a look at this front page article see this news article talks about the ongoing 27th edition of conference of parties of unfccc in egypt the conference is nearing its final stages in which a group called basic which comprises brazil india china and south africa have raised concerns about taxing products like cement and steel under carbon border adjustment mechanism this is the crux of the news article given here in this context let's understand about carbon border adjustment mechanism carbon border adjustment mechanism is a policy proposed by european union see it is nothing but a measure to reduce greenhouse gas emissions see right now most of the industries in the european union are covered by a program known as emission trading system this system charges polluters for the carbon dioxide they emit here we are specifically talking about carbon dioxide because it is the principal greenhouse gas see this emission trading system is also known as cap and trade system and it originated with the kyoto protocol now let's understand how this emission trading system works see this system is authorized and regulated by government and it is conducted between companies here each company will be given a maximum carbon pollution allowance and unused allowance can be sold to other companies the idea behind this is to ensure that companies in the aggregate do not exceed a baseline level of pollution see this baseline level of pollution will be reduced annually by the european union countries currently the price of those permits is nearly 60 dollars per ton so this gives european companies strong incentive to cut greenhouse gas emissions this is about emission trading system now moving on to see carbon border adjustment mechanism see under the carbon border adjustment mechanism european union is proposing to tighten the emission gap further see this will phase out the number of free allowances it has long given to industries exposed to trade competition like steel so in simple words the carbon border adjustment mechanism is a climate measure that is trying to prevent the risk of carbon leakage and it aims to help slash the european union's overall greenhouse gas emissions 55 percentage below 1990 levels by 2030 and the mechanism will also aims to help european union to become a climate neutral continent by 2050 see the carbon border adjustment mechanism will also help reduce the risk of carbon leakage by encouraging non eu producers to green their manufacturing processes here the term non eu producers means the producers belonging to non eu countries now let's see how does this carbon border adjustment mechanism works and how will affect the developing countries to better understanding consider india now let's assume this the european importers are importing steel from india see to purchase steel from india the european union importers under the carbon border adjustment mechanism need to purchase carbon certificates equal to the carbon price Here the carbon price is the price of carbon that was emitted by Indian steel manufacturing company while producing the steel. Now what is the case with India? India is still relying on traditional methods to produce steel. That is it uses more coal in the steel production process. This process emits more carbon right. So the European Union importers will have to pay more to purchase carbon certificates in their respective country. This discourages the import from India and obviously it impacts the India's growth. Now in contrast if the indian steel company can prove that they have already paid a price in india for the carbon which was emitted in the production of steel then the corresponding cost for the european union importer to purchase carbon certificates can be fully deducted this encourages import from india now what is the problem see india is not having such fully developed carbon pricing mechanism so this also creates problem to the developing country like india and because of all these reasons the developing countries like brazil india south africa and china are opposing the carbon border adjustment mechanism of eu that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about emission trading system and carbon border adjustment mechanism with these key points in mind now let's move on to the next news article discussion take a look at this editorial article 
see this article talks about recent supreme court judgments on the appointment of vice chancellors in state universities the supreme court said that the appointments are in violation of the regulations of university grants commission which is shortly known as ugc this article gives out opinion on whether this verdict is right or wrong so in this backdrop let us understand some of the important points mentioned in the news article before getting into discussion the syllabus relevant to this topic is given here for your reference you can go through it firstly we will look at the supreme court judgments gambhir then k gandhi versus the state of gujarat the court nullified the appointment of existing vice chancellor on the grounds that the search committee constituted under the state law did not form a panel for appointment of vice chancellor and as a result the appointment was not in accordance with ugc regulations of 2018 The Supreme Court also said that whenever there is a conflict between the state law and the UGC regulations the UGC regulations will be taken as precedents and the state law will be considered void this is the first case then the second case is from Kerala that is the case law of professor Srijit versus Dr Raja Sri the case law deals with the appointment of vice chancellor of the APJ Abdul Kalam Technological University see it was challenged on the ground that the search committee recommended only one name and this is against the ugc regulations this particular challenge was successful and the court quashed the vice chancellor's appointment on the ground that the provision in the university act relating to the search committee is in conflict with the ugc regulations and so it is void but this decision of the supreme court triggered unprecedented developments in the kerala with the state governor see as per ugc regulations of 2018 the governor of the state is the chancellor of all the universities in the state and in case vice chancellors are appointed they must be appointed through a search cum selection committee so the governor who is the chancellor of all the universities in kerala asked as many as 11 vice chancellors of other universities of the state to resign immediately he told vice chancellors to resign by quoting the supreme court's judgment and the case is now before the kerala high court as of now no vice chancellors has resigned as per the direction of the governor The issue further intensified when the Kerala High Court quashing the appointment of Vice Chancellor of Kerala University of Fisheries and Ocean Studies. Here also the ground is that particular appointment violated the UGC regulations. So here the question is whether the appointment of Vice Chancellors should be made as per the UGC regulations or as per the provisions of State University Act. Now this question is very important because under the Indian Constitution both the union and the state can legislate on a matter under the concurrent list. as education is a subject on the concurrent list this question needs to be addressed seriously now coming back here in this issue the supreme court has brought in article 254 of the indian constitution what does article 254 say article 254 talks about the doctrine of repugnancy here repugnancy means in conflict that is under article 254 if the provisions of the state law are repugnant or in conflict to the provisions of the union law the state law will become void but according to the author the court's conclusion that the provisions of the state university acts are repugnant to the ugc regulations under article 254 is faulty the main reason why the author feels this way is that according to him the repugnancy can arise only between the provisions of state university acts and the ugc act and not in the case of state university acts versus regulations of ugc see regulations are not independent legislations normally these do not require the approval of parliament and these rules and regulations have an inferior status as compared to an act the constitution cannot be assumed to equate the act with the rules secondly the ugc regulations on the appointment of vice chancellors are outside the scope of main provisions of the ugc act as none of its provisions refers to the appointment of vice chancellors so the doctrine of repugnancy does not apply to regulations instead they can be applied to the ugc act So to conclude the author says that the doctrine of repugnancy under article 254 needs to be analyzed in depth before reaching conclusions and such analysis would make it clear that a state law can be repugnant only to the central act and not the regulations and rules made by central government that's all regarding this discussion this discussion we saw about the supreme court judgments on the appointment of vice chancellors in state universities and the doctrine of repugnancy under article 254 of the indian constitution With these key points in mind now let's move on to the next news article discussion have a look at this news article this news article talks about the coastal defense exercise sea vigil 22 this exercise began on november 15 and it will be held till november 
See, this exercise is to check the preparedness of security forces and intelligence agencies against possible terrorist attacks along the entire coast of India. And this is the crux of the news article. In this context, let us understand about Sea Vigil. See, this Sea Vigil is a national level coastal defense exercise. It was conceptualized in 2018 and it is a biennial pan-India coastal defense exercise. And its objective is to validate various measures that enhances maritime security since 2611 Mumbai attack. Then the exercise also aims to activate the coastal security apparatus across India. Then the exercise will also help to assess the overarching coastal defense mechanism. And know that the exercise will be undertaken along the entire 7516 km coastline and exclusive economic zone of India. This exercise will involve all the coastal states and union territories along with other maritime stakeholders. This includes the fishing and coastal communities. The exercise is being conducted by the Indian Navy in coordination with the Coast Guard and other ministries entrusted with maritime activities. See, this exercise is a build up towards the major theater level readiness operational exercise which is shortly known as TROPEX. See, the TROPEX is conducted by Indian Navy every two years. And this sea vigil and TROPEX together will cover the entire spectrum of maritime security challenges. Coming back, the sea vigil provides the opportunity at apex level. And this is to assess the preparedness in the domain of maritime security and coastal defense. And the sea vigil will also provide a realistic assessment of strengths and weakness. So, the exercise will help to strengthen maritime and national security further. Know that this Sea Vigil 22 is the third edition and the first inaugural edition was held on January 2019 then the second edition was held on January 2021. And that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion we saw about the coastal defense exercise Sea Vigil. See these types of topics are very important for your prelims exam so make note of it. With these key points now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Have you looked at this news article? Recently, the Rajasthan Chief Minister has made a remark that advertisements would be issued to those newspapers that give publicity to government schemes. Then the Press Council of India took CEO Moto cognizance of the remark and decided to examine the particular Rajasthan newspaper which is largely circulated in the state. This is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, let us discuss about the Press Council of India. See, this council was first set up in 1966 under the Indian Press Council Act 1965. But, however, this 1965 Act was repealed in 1975. And so, the Press Council of India was abolished during emergency. Then again, this Press Council of India was re-established in the year 1979. This was under the Press Council Act 1978. So, this Press Council of India is a statutory and quasi-judicial autonomous authority. Now talking about objective, the objective of the Press Council of India is to preserve the freedom of press and this can be done by maintaining and improving the standard of newspapers and the news agencies in India. Then what about its composition? See the council comprises of a chairman and 28 members. The chairman by convention has been a retired judge of Supreme Court of India. He or she is nominated by a committee consisting of Raj Shabha chairman, then the Lok Shabha speaker and a person elected among 28 members of the Press Council of India. Then the 28 members consist of 2 Raj Shabha members, 3 Lok Shabha members, 7 working journalists other than the editor of newspapers, then 6 editors of newspapers, then 3 people with specialized knowledge on public life, then 1 person who manages news agencies and 6 persons in the business of managing newspapers. And this is all about composition. Now let's discuss its functions. The foremost function of Press Council of India is to help newspapers and news agencies to maintain their independence. Then the Press Council of India also helps to build up a code of conduct for newspapers, news agencies and journalists. And these codes are built up in accordance with high professional standards. Then the other function is to ensure the maintenance of high standards of public taste. And the council also fostered a due sense of both the rights and responsibilities of newspapers and news agencies. Then the council can also undertake studies and express their opinions in regard to any bill, legislation, law or other matters concerning to the press. Also know that the council may take CO moto cognizance in the matters of public importance. And it may also have a power to constitute a special committee to make on the spot enquiry. 
So these are all the functions of Press Council of India and that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion we saw about Press Council of India, its composition and finally some of the functions of Press Council of India. With these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next part of the news article discussion that is to discuss preliminary practice questions. Now let's take up the first question. I will read out the question. Which of the following statements is not true about the concept of carbon border adjustment mechanism? See as we discussed carbon border adjustment mechanism which is also popularly known as carbon border tax can be defined as a penalty tax to discourage import of carbon intensive goods such as steel, aluminium, cement, fertilizers etc. And this carbon border tax primarily discourages environment unfriendly production and consumer practices by making the polluting sources costlier. It also acts as an incentive for consumers and producers to shift to more energy efficient sources and products. So this is about carbon border adjustment mechanism. Now coming to the options, let's take the first option. This tax would make Indian goods less attractive for buyers and could shrink demand. Yes, in India we are following traditional practices for producing goods which are emitting more greenhouse gas emissions. So the mechanism make Indian goods less attractive and it also reduce the demand. So option A will be true. Coming to the second option, the tax would create serious near term challenges for companies with a large greenhouse gas footprint. As we discussed, it discourages environment unfriendly production and consumer practices. So it is a problem for companies with a large greenhouse gas footprint. So option B will also be true. Coming to the option C, a new source of disruption to a global trading system. Yes, the mechanism will create problem to the developing countries as they are relying more on traditional practices of goods production and they obviously release more greenhouse gases compared to developed worlds. So this create disruption in global trading system. So option C will also be true. Coming to the last option, it favors the principle of equity and common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities. See this option is not true according to carbon border adjustment mechanism. See the carbon border adjustment mechanism is against the CBDR RC and it discourages all environment unfriendly production. Coming to the CBDR RC, see it is a principle within the framework of UNFCCC. See it acknowledges the different capabilities and differing responsibilities of individual countries in addressing climate change. Once again carbon border adjustment mechanism is against differentiated responsibilities. So this will be the correct option. So the answer for the question is option D. Moving on, let's take up the second question. The term C Vigil 22 often in news represents which among the following? Let's take up the first option. Joint maritime exercise between South Africa, Brazil and India. See this option is wrong because it indicates IBS AMAR exercise. See it is a joint maritime exercise between South Africa, Brazil and India. So the option A is wrong. Coming to the second option, an annual naval exercise conducted by quad countries. See this option is also wrong because it indicates Malabar exercise. See it is conducted annually by the countries of India, Australia, Japan and USA and they are conducted in regions of Indian Ocean, Pacific Ocean, Arabian Sea and Bay of Bengal. So the option B is wrong. Coming to the option C, a pan India coastal defense exercise conducted by the Indian Navy. Yes this option is correct. As we saw in the discussion, Sea Vigil is a pan India coastal defense exercise conducted by Indian Navy. We will also verify the option D is wrong or not. Option D biennial naval exercise conducted by Indian and Russian Navy. See this option is wrong because it indicates Indra naval exercise. It is a biennial exercise conducted by India and Russia. So the correct answer for the question is option C a pan India coastal defense exercise conducted by the Indian Navy. Moving on let's take up the third question. With reference to press council of India consider the following statements. Let's take up the first statement it is a constitutional body. See this statement is incorrect because Press Council of India is a statutory quasi judicial autonomous authority which was established under the Press Council Act 1978 and it is not the constitutional body. So the statement one is wrong. Coming to the second statement, it receives substantial fund through grant in aid of the central government. See this statement is correct. The Press Council of India receives fund through grant in aid of the central government. Then it also receives fund through fees collected from the newspapers and news agencies. So the second statement is correct. Now the question is asking for incorrect statements. Statement 1 alone is incorrect. So the correct answer for the question is option A one only. And this is the quiz question for you today. I will post this quiz question in a community section. Try to answer it. Displayed here is the main question for you today. Go through the question. Write your answer and post it in the comment section.
with this we come to the end of the video if you liked our analysis please like comment and share it with your friends and don't forget to subscribe to shankarayas academy youtube channel thank you for listening